Hey, Dr. Robin McKay here and welcome back. This is Mindset Rx. It's your place to be if you are a emotionally intelligent leader and you're ready to set the tone for a positive, productive and purposeful life. It's all the things, isn't it? Week, month, year, legacy. And today is a very popular topic, I've got to say, we're going to be talking about leading an exhausted workforce today. This is something that has been building over the last couple of years as we've gone through the pandemic and the social and political challenges and difficulties we faced individually and collectively. And things are starting to take a toll and have been actually for a while now. I think that Individually, we experience hardships first, and then collectively, those hardships come to bear in the workplace as high achieving, high performer, high performing thought workers in particular are starting to look around and, and ask different questions that they've, than they've ever asked before. One of the things that I have said from the beginning of the pandemic, so this is two years now I've been saying this, that Grit, tenacity, and hard work have gotten us as far as they can get us. And now it's time for something different. And my something different are some recommendations and practices, mindsets, behaviors that come out of the field of positive psychology. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you are here with me live, I'd love to say hello. You can say hello in the comments and just make sure to put at least your first name there so I can see that sometimes the names don't always come through in the comments. If you are listening to the sister podcast, you can reach out to me at Robin, R-O-B-Y-N at drrobinmckay.com and leave a comment. I would also really love it and appreciate it if you'd be willing to leave a five-star review on the podcast as well. I think it can help a whole lot of people if we continue this grassroots movement to get the, the energy and the engagement from Mindset Rx to catch fire in the fields of tech and healthcare and fintech and all of the other high-performing areas of the world that this podcast touches. So, at the end of the time to, that we have today, I'm going to do something, a couple things actually different. And I just saw somebody pop in here. So I wanted to say hello to Desiree. She's she's here with me live. Thanks for joining me. And today we're going to be do, doing something a little bit different. That is, I'm going to be answering some of your questions. And Sarah is here. It's so good to see Sarah from way back in the day at the University of Kansas. How fun. We are going to be answering some of your questions. Before this broadcast today, I reached out to a lot of people who had raised their hands and said, yes, they wanted to be part and present to this, to this LinkedIn Live today. And my question was just very simple. What's your number one challenge or concern around employee retention or around leading an exhausted workforce? And so I'm going to be answering some of those questions live. Along with those of you who are with me live, if you've got a burning question that you would like me to address during our time together today, just type that into the comments and I'll see if I can get to that as well. So let's go ahead and dive in today. Leading an exhausted workforce. That is one big topic to unpack. It's probably, no for sure, it's not something that we're going to get all the way unpacked today. It's a conversation that I've been having for the last couple of years with leaders in tech and healthcare in particular. We're seeing the great resignation. We're seeing the great reshuffle. We're even seeing from a consciousness perspective, a great awakening as people are starting to really question why they're doing what they're doing. They're looking around their lives. They're looking around their work and saying, what is the point to all of this? And if they can't find it an acceptable answer to that question, they're going to keep seeking the solution. They're going to keep seeking the answer. And that may or may not be with your organization, which leads to in my, uh, my unofficial research that I've done on this, on this topic, but it also bears out in, in the official research as well that right now leaders are concerned about a couple of things. They're concerned about retention, engagement, managing fatigue and burnout among their employees, and then 
you know, making this leap into what's next. So also encouraging productivity and innovation because the, the, um, Markers and milestones really haven't changed at all, but we do have a depleted workforce. In fact, what I've been seeing for a while now is that people have reached surge capacity. That is, our bodies, our minds, our spirits are only equipped to deal with stress for so long before we need a break. And the conditions that we've collectively and individually been living under for the past couple of years has created a chronic stress condition, which then leads to surge capacity, actually surpassing surge capacity. Everybody is burned out. Maybe not you. And in fact, a lot of the leaders who I talk with personally sometimes don't get why people are burned out. So I want to start with you as leaders who are here raising your hand, saying that you're concerned about retention, engagement, managing fatigue and burnout and productivity and innovation among the workforce. I'm gonna start with you because this is always the best place to start with the people who are in the room right now. Here are a couple of things that I have observed about leaders who are conscientious. They want their workforce to do a great job. They want to be innovative. They want to be first to market, first in class, best in class. From a personality perspective, what I see is that top leaders are often pretty resilient when it comes to stress. There's a factor of personality called neuroticism. It's one of the big five personality factors. And neuroticism, while I hate that word because nobody ever uses it properly, on a very basic level, just simply means how sensitive are you to stress and how emotionally reactive is your nervous system? It's, it's very much a brain-based factor of personality. So leaders who come in and talk with me about workforce issues and concerns with burnout among their people are not necessarily conscious of their own burnout because they're pretty resilient and they're pretty, they score pretty low on sensitivity to stress. They're not particularly emotionally reactive. Many of them, interestingly, are marathon runners, can tolerate frustration very, very well, don't need a whole lot of external um, encouragement in terms of their own progress, their own achievements, and so on. If we look at neuroticism on a normal distribution curve, because all personality factors exist on a normal distribution curve, what we see is a lot of the leaders who I'm talking to are in, I'm going to give them about the, the lower quartile in terms of scoring on neuroticism, which means that in a room of a hundred people or a thousand people, they're gonna be some of the least neurotic, most rock steady people in the room. The workforce on the other hand is going to have a much more traditional curve. They're gonna fall more in the, the average range to high range on neuroticism. So they're gonna be more sensitive to stress. They're going to be more emotionally reactive. They're gonna be more anxious, more depressed, more with a quick trigger, a hair trigger, easily angered, easily frustrated. They're gonna be doing some over behaviors, over drinking, over eating, over gambling, over sexing, over drugging. As a self-soothing method to calm their, their nerves as a coping mechanism. So this is a very different profile of an average person in the workforce compared to some of the leaders who are coming in and talking to me. So the leaders will say, I don't understand why these people, these people, sometimes they even say that these people are having so many problems with burnout. I don't feel burned out. Neither should they. And though we have some insight into that there are individual differences, I do want to just bring to your attention how important it is when you're seeking solutions for your workforce who's exhausted to understand that you're going to be an outlier most likely in terms of how you deal with your own stress. In fact, what I find with top leaders who work with me privately and who consult with me within their organizations, um, the way that they burn out is actually a physical burnout. So they're going to have things like kidney infections, and bladder infections. They might develop some kind of cancer, some kind of chronic condition. They might struggle with their weight. 
but they're not necessarily going to be moment to moment sensitive or aware of what their body needs when it comes to stress. Again, it's not that their body doesn't feel stress. It's just that the brain is wired in such a way that it doesn't really pay, <clears throat> excuse me, pay attention to how much stress the body's under. So I, I wanted to beat that drum for just a minute because I think that it's an important perspective shift when we're looking at solutions for the workforce. When you can look at your own personality characteristics, how your brain is wired and say, maybe what works for me in terms of burnout prevention and recovery isn't gonna work out for the average person in the workforce. This is something that I address when I work with organizations on the group level, the team level, with my burnout and my burnout RX program and my optimism RX program. When we're really looking at what are those changes that we can make individually that affect the whole workforce within that larger group of people who may or may not be leaders. So I look at things in the optimism RX, for example, like making the jump from boss to coach making the jump from employee to creator. There are some mindset and heart set shifts that we have to make if we're actually going to overcome the challenge of burnout and exhaustion in the workforce and prevent employees leaving and um, increase the retention that people are wanting in their organizations, as well as engagement and productivity and all those other good things that we're re really wanting for our organizations. But we have to really look at not the typical things. This is not a conversation that I'm going to have about meditate more or get out of your chair more or exercise more or drink more water. We all know that. We actually have to look at the deeper reasons for why people are not actually doing those things. And that actually has to do with how individual workers are thinking about their work and thinking about what's acceptable for them compared to their leadership. I wanna take time out here because I'm seeing some other people just jumping in and saying, hello, Doc Angela is here. Christy's here from South Dakota, so good to see you. I'm making my trip up there tomorrow to see my mom. So that'll be a little bit more chilly than what I'm used to down here in Arizona. But I'm so glad you all are here joining me with this conversation about leading an exhausted workforce. So the conversations, just to circle back to this, this piece, the conversations that I have with large groups within organizations around recovering from burnout, preventing burnout in the future are different, quite different than the conversations that I have individually with the leaders who are wired quite differently from average workers. This is an important piece to consider as you're making decisions about the remedies you're going to start implementing in your own organizations in terms of burnout. I know that we've got some healthcare folks here and I, and I understand how difficult things are for, for everybody right now within healthcare in terms of burnout and people quitting and leaving and um, lack of staff and, and so on. And it's very, very challenging. I wanna acknowledge that there is no easy solution to this, but I do really believe that it starts with leadership first, and it starts with leading yourself and understanding deeply how you yourself recover from burnout, recover from exhaustion, and even acknowledging that maybe you're not as sensitive to the burnout and exhaustion as, of other peop as other people are within your organization, understanding that there are tremendous individual differences when it comes to recovering from burnout. I'm just taking a look at my notes here. I'm so glad you're enjoying the conversation, Angela. And again, if anybody who's here with me live has a question or wants me to address anything specifically about how to lead an exhausted workforce, drop those into the comments and I'll, I'll take a look at those in just a few minutes. So let's talk about some of these questions that have come forward. I'm gonna click over to my LinkedIn and I'm gonna start answering some of these questions. So Libby writes, her biggest question is, this, how do you retain, how do you retain? 
people who are in your organization? How do you prevent burnout and retain people who are in your organization? Big question, good question, important question. From a leadership perspective, what I want you to start thinking about is not how to get people to stay, but to actually start answering this question, Libby, and this one is for you specifically, and it may apply to some other people who are, who are listening to this as well, but really start looking and answering that question for yourself. What would it take to get me to stay? And please, above all, don't take it personally when somebody leaves. I know that this is a hard one because the, the workforce is so stressed right now in terms of people leaving, making job changes. But it is very important to go within, ask yourself, what would it take to get me to stay? What transformation do I need to make for me to stay? And then also, if somebody does leave, especially those who are close to you or the, the departures are unexpected, don't take it personally. My dad always says, and some of you have heard me say this before, it'll probably turn out better than you think. But that is a mindset shift. And the mindset shift means what you're going to be doing is saying, if not that person, then who? I know it costs time and money to fill positions, to backfill positions. I understand that. And yet, if we can just turn our attention to what's possible in that moment, rather than languishing in what just happened or that somebody left and left us in a lurch, that can really shift the conversation and shift the feeling and the energy around recruiting somebody new to it. So in terms of retaining those, those exhausted employees, sometimes it's better for them to go. Sometimes it is. We don't want to cling on to people either. I have a bee in my bonnet that's related to this, and I hope you don't mind if I share this. The bee in my bonnet is this, and I've done it myself, but I want us to stop doing this. I want us to stop thinking about and referring to people as resources. I know we have whole departments called human resources, but I really want us to stop thinking about that. I don't think that I'm a resource. I think that gas and oil is a resource. I think that coal is a resource. I don't think that I am a resource. I think that I and you and all of your people, all of the people who are contributing to the advancement of the vision of the organization, I think that they're not resources. I think that they're human beings. I think that they have the capacity to contribute their creativity and their enthusiasm and their joy. I think that they have the capacity to solve problems beyond anything you could have hoped for or imagined. But I don't think anybody wants to be thought of as a resource. When you look at it in the context of what else do we consider resources? So if we really want to start retaining employees, we need to stop thinking about them as resources and remember, and I'm not saying that you do this personally, but I remember the moment when somebody pointed out to me the comparison between human resources and other resources on the planet, like gas and oil. And I was so appalled that I thought of myself or other people as resources. And certainly in some of my marketing materials, even early on in the pandemic, I had said, I believe that people are our greatest resource. We're going back and editing that because I, I'm, I'm walking that one back. That one does not feel aligned anymore. And it certainly doesn't feel like it's a contribution to where we're headed in the future in terms of recalibrating our relationship with work and time and money, for example. So we have to start, start thinking about people as people. And if somebody is not meant to stay in a position, if they're meant to leave, then bless them and release them. And if you can bless them and release them, the energy that that runs on is so much more sweet and promising than the energy of regret or anger or fear or contraction. See, a lot of the work that leaders are needing to do right now isn't even about the practical applied to-do list. Now it's about the energetics. It's about the energy behind what you're doing. So think about that. 
Just ask, how can I bless and release them? And how can I call in that person who's perfect for this position? So it's no longer about just filling a spot because guess what? We're not cogs in a great machine. We are not clones. We are not robots. We are human beings and we are meant to contribute and to create. And when I referred a little while ago to one of the lectures in the Optimism Rx series that I give on making the leap from, from boss to coach, from employee to creator, that's what I'm talking about there. Isn't that a better way of thinking about it? I really like that. And I think it's much more aligned with where we're headed to, to um, in the future as we recreate the relationship we have with work. Oh, and Angela, <laughs> I don't know how much I like this, but Angela writes, human resources is undergoing a name change to human capital management. Hoy. <laughs> We still have some work to do, don't we? I don't want to be capital either. I don't. It just sounds so impersonal and it sounds like I'm expendable and I don't like it. I don't know how you all feel about that, but I want us to start thinking about other ways of thinking about and referring to the people, the human beings, the humanity who's who makes this world what it is. I really want us to bring humanity back into the organizations. For a long time, I've been saying my job is to go in and heal the soul of corporate. And I know a lot of us are like soul and corporate, like what is that? Does that even go together? Well, it does. It does because the souls of the people who are working in these organizations, the souls are crying out for something different. And if they're leaving, that's probably why. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do around this, don't we? <laughs> Let's go over to another question. Let's see here. Fernando. Fernando, I think he's at Caterpillar. He says, my concern is how to maintain the team focused, how to maintain the team to be focused and engaged. We're coming from a once in a lifetime experience, meaning the pandemic, and immediately getting into a very complicated and demanding workload. At a personal level, we're going back to social interactions and there's just too many things. It's just, it can feel overwhelming. I think that who can't relate to that because the world is shifting again. We all want things to get back to normal and I don't even know what normal is anymore. I, I don't see us ever going back to pre-pandemic normal. I think that the only thing that is actually certain now and in the future is more uncertainty. And I'm gonna go back to what I my the first question that I answered, which was we have to be able to maintain and celebrate our humanity. And there is such a gift in speaking out loud, Fernando, what you just wrote to me in this, in this LinkedIn message, to speak this out loud to your community, to the team that you're on, to lower the water around the iceberg of who you are and just say, listen, I know that this is hard. And yes, we are in this together, but I also know this is hard and we are in transition and really understanding that this is a transition. It's a journey that you're on and there are going to be bumps in the road. And even still, even with the challenges that we don't even know are coming yet, I've been known to say, I feel like I'm living in the Hunger Games or the Matrix right now. So we don't know what the, what the, game masters are going to have in store for us tomorrow, the next day, next fall, next winter. But we do know that there's going to be more uncertainty and more stress. So when we are in this together and we're connected to each other eye to eye and heart to heart, and we're making decisions based on what the heart, the wisdom of the heart says, rather than what the intellect, the logic is telling us because the intellect and the logic is just basically going to be programmed to recreate over and over again, that which we've experienced before. 
I think the intellect is the part of us that wants to get back to normal. Our intuition, our creativity is like, no, no more normal. Let's go play and have fun and make something new and expand our horizons. So the more we can honor intuition and creativity among our, indivi our individual contributors, among our leaders, toward that, that common goal, the vision of the organization, the more we can invite that in. I think that levity, that flow actually elevates people out of the exhaustion that they've been in for as long as they have, because we're gonna create something new something different, something people have never thought of before, even knew that they needed. That's so much more interesting, engaging and exciting than just recreating the wheel over and over and over again. I'd leave too. All right, we've got time for one more question. Let me just click over and see if anybody here. Hi, Fernando, I was just talking about you. You can go back and listen to it if you weren't here for all of it, maybe you were. But I do want us to really start looking at how can we bring in more opportunities for creativity and more compassion for just the human experience. Remembering once again, we're not robots, we're not clones, we're not a cog in a great machine. Not, never have been, never will be. And we're not resources either. We're people and we're meant to be contributing. And I'm sharing this with you as leaders because the first people who can actually create ripples in the organization are people like you. By carrying this message forward into your organizations, by looking at people a little bit differently, with curiosity, with openness, with wonderment, with awe, with humor. These are uniquely human characteristics. And what a joy it is to bring that into the workplace or what a joy it could be. The road back from exhaustion does not have to be arduous, but it does have to be intentional. And that is the work that I do with organizations. I've had the opportunity to work with Intel now in two different parts of the organizations with my Optimism RX programs. And it has been so delightful to come in every single month with the people within the organization and teach my Optimism RX curriculum around making the leap from manager or boss to coach, around breaking the busyness cycle, around thriving as an emotionally intelligent leader in a technical world, around living and leading during uncertain times, and then having Q and A's with the people, the participants, so that I'm sort of embedded in that workforce. And I think that's one of the greatest solutions that I can think of. And this is not just for me. I'm one person, I'm one psychologist, and there are many, many psychologists like me. And I think collectively, we believe we are wired for this time. And if you don't have a psychologist embedded in your organization, somebody who's not just looking at mental health issues like overcoming burnout or dealing with depression and anxiety, those are very important to mental health is your health is your wealth. But looking at optimal human development, and looking at what the best the best of what is possible for our workforce. If you don't have somebody like me in your organization, this is, I think, a game changer to make a decision to bring an expert in to support the efforts. It's like, not doing that would be like a surgeon doing an appendect appendectomy on herself. She could, but why would she? And we don't often think about psychologists as people who get embedded with organizations, but I do think it is time to ha start having that conversation. And those are the conversations I love to have with leaders like you as well. So if that's something that lands for you or that you want to have a conversation with me about, reach out to my assistant, Brandy. Her email is brandy, B-R-A-N-D-I, at drrobinmckay.com, R-O-B, Dr. D-R, R-O-B-Y-N, M-C-K-A-Y.com. And ask to set up some time to have a conversation with me about creating a customized program for your people to address some of these big issues that we have in terms of exhaustion, burnout, as it relates to employee retention and 
productivity and engagement and all the things that you all are concerned about from a leadership perspective. Let's go back over here to the questions. Give me just a second to scroll down here. Here's one. She says, I'm in healthcare. Our workers are exhausted from being short staffed and an overabundance of work. Many of my staff are women and also have family responsibilities. She says, I see the argument that they all feel they should be paid more. And as employer, as an employer, I have to respond with what, where will the money come from? Where will the money come from? So I want to end with this because this is such an important conversation. The phrase throwing money at something to make it go away comes up. And I'm not saying that this person is doing that at all. In fact, quite the opposite. But I think that when people are dissatisfied, the first place they're going to look at is the financial solution. They're going to want more. And what the research shows around money is that even if you're given, I think it's a 50% increase salary bump, let's say, let's just say it's a 50%, it might even be more than that. But even if you're given a 50% bump in salary, your happiness and satisfaction of, about your job only increases by about 5%. So there's a weak correlation between how much money you, you make and how happy you are. More money is not gonna solve the problem of burnout. at least not in the long term. It may temporarily put a Band-Aid over a gaping wound. Here, let me give you more money and then you'll feel better. That'll last for about five minutes. Realistically, probably more like about six weeks. And then there will be something else. Now, this is something that we could spend an entire episode unpacking the link between recovering from burnout and how much money somebody is making. And I do believe that everybody not just deserves, but is worthy of a living wage, certainly. So I want us to start thinking about other ways. I know that the workforce, especially in healthcare is so cynical and so burned out right now that they don't even want to talk about how they can shift. I had a conversation with a nurse the other day. She uh, has worked in a COVID unit. She was at my yoga class, super fit, super optimistic. And she told me, she said, Robin, they, meaning management, had somebody come in, somebody like me come in and talk to the nursing staff. And she was just like, she's like, we're over it, Robin. We don't want to hear another expert coming in and talking to us about what we can do to feel better. That's where we're at. I don't have a solution for that in this moment. But I do know that the people who are in front of me right now, you who are listening, who are watching, who are asking these questions, I do know that it can start with you. This is not to blame you at all. We're all part of a broken system, but we do have to start with healing the trauma and healing the burnout that exists in each of us first. When you heal the trauma, you heal the burnout inside of you then you have a different perspective on what actually helps the people around you. And sometimes, this is very interesting, I've noticed this across the course of my career, as one person begins to heal, the entire system begins to transform as well. It's very interesting. It's very interesting how that works. So not an easy solution to the question of, I can't pay my people more money, I don't have more money, where is that coming from? It's not a simple answer, not a simple solution. And I can sense the frustration and even possibly desperation around that. And those are hard emotions, but it does, the, the process of answering the questions actually does start with noticing and acknowledging the emotions that are connected with it. So I hope you find that helpful. I hope you find that helpful. So as we're closing out for today, I want to say thank you for all of you who joined me here live. I want to say thank you if you're listening to the recording on LinkedIn Live or on the podcast. Thank you so much. It makes my day and it 
warms my heart that I'm able to contribute to you and you all get, you all contribute to me as well by being here with me. If this message landed for you, please share it with other people. This is something that I don't think that we can talk about too much. And it is something that we have to continue to have conversations about and examine and move the needle on because this is not going away. The, the world that we live in is not going away. So we have to find ways to recover. We have to find ways to innovate. We have to find ways to jump timelines. If you're a sci-fi person, I am. So I love talking about jumping timelines, but we have to find ways to help ourselves, to support ourselves as we make contributions, not from a servitude or a slave kind of mentality, but from a contributor, from a, from a contributor mentality from a place of, I am a creator and I am here to contribute. I am not a resource. I'm not a cog in a great machine. I'm not a robot and I'm not a clone and neither are you. And I send you from my heart, just my deepest appreciation. If you would like to have a conversation with me privately about working with you or your organization, reach out, as I said, to Brandy, B-R-A-N-D-I at drrobinmckay.com. We'll put her email in the show notes. And I will see you all next week.